Hey there, my name is Don. I'm one of the pastors here at Church on the Move, and I am so excited you have found this video. Pastor Gabe is about to bring a message on unity that I have never heard, and you need to get this. You're at the right place, you're at the right time. Let's watch it together. How y'all doing? It's so good to see you. It is so good to have you online, wherever you're watching from, whenever you're watching. If you don't know me, uh, my name is Gabriel. I am the pastor here at Church on the Move, South, Church on the Move, Glimple, Church on the Move, if we cross the street, Jinx, whichever part of the city we are actually in, this is where I am the pastor, and I am thrilled to be here this morning talking to you about unity. We've been talking about unity for the last couple of weeks. If you've missed that, you can find these messages here at our Church on the Move South podcast. You can also find it on our Church on the Move South Facebook page. We're starting to do something a little bit different, mainly because we have a lot of people who are also watching online, so we're filming. So periodically, I will look at the cameras. I'm getting better at doing it, taking my focus off you beautiful people and looking into the camera at the supposed beautiful people watching from their couch, kitchen, car, wherever they're at. Uh, but it's really, really cool to begin to uh, jump back into the gathering, but really the gathering goes well beyond what we're doing here. It goes into who we are as a people, as followers of Christ, and we're talking about unity, and we're talking about a unified or a united church. We're not necessarily diving into how do we unify or unite our world. We're not talking about how to unite our country, as is a big topic now, there's a, there's a lot going in that direction. We're not really getting anywhere, as it seems obvious, but what we are talking about is how do we unite as a church? How do we unite as a church? And when I say a church, what I don't mean is church on the move specifically. This is not a message geared towards uh, this theoretical divisiveness within our four walls. It's really not the point, not the point of what we're doing here today. When I say church, what I mean is followers of Jesus, not just here, not just locally, not just in Tulsa, not just in our country, but in our world. What does that mean and what does that look like? We say this all the time, the church is not a place, the church is not a building. I think most people see it that way, and it isn't that we couldn't answer that question or speak to that if we had to. Is the church a building? We go, no, church is people. But what does that mean? And how does it mean? And how do we unite as a people following Jesus when we are so disconnected from the church and the rest of the world? We're a community. We gather together here. We don't swap communities Sunday to Sunday. We gather together as a people. So what does unity look like for us, and what I want to talk about specifically today is what does unity look like in the relationships closest to you? I want to speak specifically to individuality. Individuality is a hot topic in our culture, it has become increasingly more prevalent in conversation, much more so than whenever I was younger. It wasn't that we didn't experience it and express it. It wasn't that you didn't go through it either. I've seen the tapes of Woodstock, and maybe some of you were there. Um, but individuality is something that is very much on the forefront of our culture. And how do we navigate individuality as a church? Because it seems to be that what we're kind of after is to not suppress all individuality, but we're trying to kind of get unified around the same things so that we can kind of move together. And too much distinction throws us off. And that happens as a community, but it happens specifically as a smaller family dynamic. It happens in your relationships that are close to you, it happens in your work environment. It happens all the time, and the goal of this message is to help you, specifically where you're at. And so as always, what we get out of our time together has a lot to do with how we receive what's said. Now, 
I don't mean that you have to believe and buy into every single thing that I say, but what I would also challenge you with is this, that God is speaking. This is one of the purposes of our gathering is that the Lord speak to us, and he has given certain gifts to people, and one of the gifts that I possess is that of a pastor. It doesn't mean that I have been empowered from on high, and I don't have to do any work or digging. I wish that were the case, but that's not the case. But what it does mean is that God has put me here to play a part. And that part, hopefully, is to speak what he wants you to hear. My job today is to get out of the way. To the best of my ability, every single time I get up here, I'm trying to get out of the way. It's a tricky balance, though, because I am also an individual with individual leanings and individual personality, and I want that to shine through because it makes this feel better and more authentic, and you love it when you see this unfiltered version of me. That's a face statement. You, 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 you appreciate that. You want it to be like, hey, you know, who, who are you? You speak to us the way you would speak to us. However, I am desperate for you to hear the voice of God. I am desperate for you to hear what God would say to you. And I believe with all of my heart that there is a specific thing the Holy Spirit is going to leave you with. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care how connected you feel to this. I don't care if you're looking at your watch going, all right, how many more minutes? There's 75 more minutes of this message. (laughs) (laughs) One service, we can do what we want. That's not true. I'll be done here in about 25, 30 minutes. So you can just, that right there will allow you to hear me better, knowing that you'll be out of here by like, I don't know, 11, 15. So here's the deal. We're going to pray in a second. Before I do, I want to read a scripture or several scriptures actually from 1 Corinthians. Now, before I read it, I will say this. There are many things in this book, if you've been raised in church, if you've been in services for any amount of time, that you have heard a lot. You may not understand everything, and you may not have everything memorized. In fact, I know you don't, but at the same time, there are a lot of things that as we get into Scripture, at least this is the case for me, as we read it, uh, there are things that I kind of just sort of check out with. I check out. I check out to some of the analogies. It doesn't mean that I disagree with them. It just means I've heard them a lot. And it's difficult at times to connect them to where I'm at. So I'm going to read a series of scriptures in 1 Corinthians. Put them up here on the screen. Here's what I ask. I ask that you kind of try to hear this with fresh ears. Like you're hearing it for the first time because what is being said here in the book of 1 Corinthians is Paul, the apostle, follower of Jesus, gifted by God to go in and plant seeds called churches in cities all over the region, which is why we are here today is because of the work that the early apostles did. And people bought into it, and it caught on like wildfire. So what Paul is saying to this church, these people in Corinth, is something relatively new to them. Did he say it to them in person? It doesn't say, but he is writing a letter to them explaining an idea, a structure that is the church. And this isn't something that we can sort of pass off and say, you know what, I've heard that before. This is a manual, a rule book that we are commanded to follow. But as we all kind of know, enough time passes And we can sort of lose touch with how things originally began. And we can sort of pay attention to things we want to pay attention to more than the things that are actually foundational. And so what I'm going to read to you is something foundational. And so I'm going to start here. We'll put it up here. But again, hear this with fresh ears. 1 Corinthians 12. In verse 12, Paul says this, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Verse 14, even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Not the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. 
It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. I'm going to skip to verse 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And last. Verse 27, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Before I go any further, I would love us to pray and invite God into our personal space to speak to us personally. And this is, again, up to you as to what you receive from this. The Holy Spirit is here. Where two or more are gathered, our Lord is here. Imagine that. We're kind of searching for Christ. At times, he feels very distant from us, but he's right here with us. Has something to say to you. Has something to say to me. But as always, I find it very helpful and beneficial to silence our mind for a moment and open our heart and receive his word to us. So can we do that together, uh, please? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for your word. It is an anchor. It is a light. It is our path. It tells us where to go. Lord, we don't understand every little detail. We don't see the depth of what you intended through the words you've written to us. But what we ask both in this room and online, wherever we're watching, is that you speak to us through your Holy Spirit. That we are not here to just hear a good thing and say that was a good thing. We are here to hear from you, to receive revelation, something that changes our trajectory. We recognize that you have called us, that you are equipping us, that you are moving us. But we silence for a moment, Lord, our thoughts. We rein them in, we open our hearts, and we ask you, speak in a way that we can hear, in a way that we can understand. I thank you so much for every person under the sound of my voice, and I believe that you are leading. And that gives me encouragement. That builds my faith. That is a tremendous truth. We are not alone, that you are with us. In every season, no matter where we find ourselves, whether we're in challenge right now, or whether we're in a good place, you're with us, and we can trust in that. And we thank you for everything that you're doing and for that one specific command that you drop in our hearts today. We believe we receive it by faith. We believe that we will receive it and move on it, do something with it. And it is in the name of Jesus we pray. Everyone said, amen. Our body was meant to work in harmony. Our body was meant to work as one unit. This is never more evident than when you're a child. You don't think of it when you're a child, when you're young. I see young people in here, you don't think about this. Rarely do you think about your body working in harmony because it just sort of does it naturally. When you're a kid, you don't think about the individual parts of your body too much, what's going on inside, because everything just sort of works. If you fall, if you get hurt, you just sort of bounce back. I've been watching like YouTube fails videos lately, and there's nothing more horrifying than seeing someone of age fall in a way that they were not intending to fall. There's nothing more frustrating than to see a young person, a kid, a child fall in a way that would just break me and send me to EOC for the remainder of my life. But they just seem to bounce back up from it as if nothing happened. When you're young, the body just seems to be made of rubber and it just seems to work. But this changes, changes as you get older. 
We all know this. When I was a kid, I didn't really get hurt much. It doesn't mean I never felt pain. I'm not a superhero. It just means I didn't really break any bones. I had a few stitches, but nothing really major happened in my life until about 10, 12 years ago, uh, I had back surgery. I had a disc in my back that was crushing a nerve, and this was going on for months, and it was unbearable. I was overseeing our children's department at the time, and so I'm speaking in kids' classrooms, and I'm going out to our summer camp, and I'm talking, and I'm backstage before I go out, and I am rubbing the back of my leg. I'm rubbing the back of my leg because the pain in my back was going down to my foot to the point where my foot would get numb. And the pain was excruciating, and little did the children know what pain gospel Gabe was in before I went out there. And so I'm rubbing the back of my knee as fast and hard as I can. I had pain medication that I would take every other time, but I did not want to be on this stuff preaching the word of God. There would be no telling where the spirit would lead if I was on the hydrocodone out there preaching to the kids. Believe me, I wanted to be. Uh, the pain was too much. The pain was so, so great that, that I, I remember walking out of a movie and, and just feeling like, I don't know if I can make it to my car. Eventually, I had back surgery. It was this crazy story for another time. Uh, everything sort of changed after that. But, but I, 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 I was aware, became aware, realized of individual parts of the body. And when they don't work right, Everything changes when one part of the body is in pain. The whole body suffers. When this little disc in my back was out of whack, then my whole body suffered. When you're young, your body works in harmony. As you get older, the individual parts of the body begin to cry out. They begin to raise their voice. When something is not right, you know it. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. The church started in harmony. The church began in unity. I want you to consider this. Before Jesus was crucified, his disciples were arguing, a couple of them anyway, were arguing about which ones of us are going to be the greatest. A mother goes to Jesus and says, can my sons be essentially your favorite two disciples of these following? And they were right there. They could hear it. They were furious at this, as you could imagine. Could you imagine how you would feel about the mother who goes up and says, hey, Jesus, can I talk to you? And not secretly, can I talk to you? You see my sons, they're so wonderful. Can they sit at your right and your left? And I'm sure they're back there going, hey. And that's what was happening with Jesus' followers right before his crucifixion. Right before Jesus is crucified, Peter raises up his voice as Jesus predicts that his disciples will disown him and scatter. And Peter says, I won't do it. They may. They may do it, but not me. Again, imagine what that would do to the group. He's like, I could see them disowning you, Jesus, but I won't do it. Not only will I not disown you, but I will die. I will die if I have to. And we know that Peter did not die that night. He denied that night. But then what we see is Christ crucified. We see Christ resurrected. We see Christ appearing to his disciples time and time again over a 40-day period after his resurrection. And before Jesus goes up to heaven, the last words he speaks are not go into all nations and make disciples of all people. What Jesus says last is go to Jerusalem and wait for me. Wait for me. Very important statement. Not just for them at that time, but it's prevalent for us as a group. It's prevalent for us as individuals. How many times have we rushed into life not knowing exactly what to do when the antidote to our situation is right there in the last words of Christ, wait for me. This is what he commanded his followers to do, wait they go into an upper room in the book of Acts. It talks about this upper room. It talks about 120 people. But here's what's interesting. There's a bit of a distinction between pre-crucifixion and post-crucifixion resurrection. It says there are 120 people. It doesn't speak about the gender difference in the room. It doesn't say there are this many men, this many women. Most of the time in the Gospels, when it talks about a group, it talks about the distinctions. It says there were this many men. But not now. 120, 120, why? 
Because the church started unified, united. This is what the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God unifies and unites. The Spirit of God fell on the room, shook the room. The church was born that day. 3,000 people came in to be a part of the body of Christ that day. The church started off in harmony, but as all things do over time, as it began to grow in age and as in reach, it began to divide a little bit. And so Paul is writing this letter telling the church in Corinth, here's what matters. This thing that you're in is new. It's new to you. It's not new to us Jews. We have been a part of following God, Yahweh, for thousands of years. But this church thing, which is what it's all been pointing to, is new for all of us. And there are some structural things that you need to be aware of. This is how this works. This is a body. Now, it's very important for us to think of what we are And not just in this room, and not just this church on the move spread out in different locations in our city, but every church that you pass. It's important for you to think about that and them as a body. We are a part of a body. We're not separate bodies. We're one body. Here's why that matters. Because a body has a master design. There is a master architect who put you together. Same is true For this body. There is creativity in the body. There is an unbelievable functionality in the body. But what's also true about the body is the body is made up of individual parts. The body is not just one blob. The body is different parts. Whenever I hit my finger, I say, I hit my finger. I don't say, I hit my body. The body is made up of different parts parts, but yet it's individual. How do we navigate this individuality? The world is crying out to be heard. Individuals are crying out to be heard. We all want to be heard. We all want to be seen. We, as Christ followers, are not comfortable saying, you know what, I am a person, yes, but I, 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 sort, of, I sort of subject my, my, my right to individuality and I will just sort of follow the mass herd. We don't do this, so how does the individual operate in God's church, in the church of Jesus Christ? I want to liken it to a family. Some of this I have experience with, and some of this I don't have experience with it yet. But I fear it's coming. A family starts off with two people, man, woman. They meet each other. They come from completely different backgrounds. They find each other. They get to know each other. They fall in love with each other. And then they begin to work out the kinks, little by little, sometimes littler by littler, You begin to work out the kinks and the differences between you. I've yet to meet any couple, no matter how you've been, how long you've been married, that don't have your own little way about you. But here's what's interesting. The longer you spend time with one another, the more you become united. You're not the same at all. You know this. Wives, you know this. You wish this weren't true, but it is true. You're not the same. But yet, you begin to move in the same direction, God willing. Not always the case, but usually that's kind of how it goes. You begin to develop a familial culture. You start bringing kids into the mix at some point during the development of this culture. Your children are born. If you have more than one of them, then you notice that they are different from one another. My daughter Jane was the most peaceful child in the world. My son Charlie came in and disrupted all of that. They are different. But yet they have become a part of our family culture. Now here's the part that I haven't got to yet. I'm getting close. My daughter is a senior this year. She's about to turn 18. My son just turned 16. Even though I can see the differences in my children, they are still very much a part of our family culture. Now here's what's going to happen. My children are going to meet their spouse. Or they're going to move out of the house and begin to stand on their own two feet. The differences in who they are, the way they see life, their worldview is going to begin to develop. 
And in that development, there are going to arise certain distinctions, things that make them different from mom and dad. Mom and dad are very different from each other, but we together make up one sun, and everything's supposed to move around the sun. But the children, then as they grow, they begin to sort of break off as other planets, and their own little gravitational pull begins to develop. I'm not looking forward to this day because I think that there are going to be parts of it that are quite painful. I'm sure if I could talk to some of you whose children have left the house, you would say it isn't the easiest thing in the world, especially whenever you see your children doing things that you, as a family culture, would have never done. We would have never done that. We would have never said that. We don't think like that. We certainly clean better than that. What is wrong with them? And it's usually like he was a good boy until that woman came along, you know? <laughs> Can't tell you how many times I have seen those words behind the eyes of a mother. She did this, changed him. I'm nervous about this because I know that lives in my wife somewhere. But what's going to happen is they're going to begin to figure out who they are. It can be, I'm sure, somewhat insulting as a mom and dad when your children go out and they take something that you value deeply and they see it a different way and they don't value it the same way you do. A lot of problems and much, much Relational tension is developed because of distinctions. But here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about distinction. We're not the same, and this is obvious. We all know this. We're not all made to be the same. You know this. I want to read this to you really quick from the book of Romans, chapter 12, three verses. For just as each of us has one body with many members... And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member be belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. I want to talk for a minute about distinction. We're different parts, made and created by God differently. Now, here's what it means to be a group of parts. It doesn't mean we're just a group of the same thing, the same part. It means that we are different. Distinction does not mean that we may be separated. We all were together, and then you moved out. We're separated, but we see everything similarly. That's not distinction. Distinction is that we more than likely see many things or most things differently. See, I think as a people, we're pretty okay with people's different gifts. Like, I'm not administrative, right? I'm not a detail person. I'm creative. He's not. Those kinds of distinctions are things that I think most of us don't have a problem with. Where the challenge lies and what threatens our unity as families and as a body is the distinction that produces a different worldview. We see these distinctions as obstacles to overcome. You see them in your children. If you don't have kids, you know it because you can look at your parents and you can see what makes you different, things you're very proud of. But one day, there's a little thing that's going to grow up and do it to you. And you're not going to love it. But often what happens is we see these distinctions as something to overcome, like a child who won't eat their vegetables. We just need to discipline this out of them. My dad and I, very different people. I have a lot of people and I find it to be humorous at times. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's an honor, it's a compliment. On one hand and on the other hand, I just think, man, you don't know. A lot of people will tell me, man, you remind me, you're just like your dad. Of you and your brother, you're just like your dad. You're just like your dad. You're just like your dad. And I think, man, go tell my dad that. <laughs> I'm not just like my dad. 
He knows that and I know that. My dad has a way of seeing the world. My dad had an experience as a child, experiences that shaped his worldview. Couple that with the giving of gifts from our Lord that produced something amazing in my father. Now, I don't have the same experience. I was not raised in the home my father was raised in. My mother, as far as I know, was not an alcoholic. (laughs) My parents did not divorce. My father did not abandon me. My parents were tremendous providers. I was not raised to fight the same battles. Now I have a different worldview, and my worldview is one that sees people with tremendous compassion. There's a lot that goes into that. Some of it is my own personal story, my own personal experience, my own personal struggle. Some of that is my makeup, but I'm convinced that what God has done is that's all in one pot of stew, and he has sprinkled in who he is and turned it into something for his purposes. Now that may be evident today, for the most part, but when I was 16 years old, not so evident. I think the question that my parents would have been asking if I could have asked, hey, what's one thing you'd like to say is, why is this so challenging? Why won't you just kind of do what we do here? And it wasn't that I was incredibly disobedient, that I was just off doing this and off doing that. I wasn't a perfect kid, but I believed in Jesus. I believed in Jesus. I believed in the things I was taught. Whether I liked it or not, I believed it to be true. And so there was only a a short distance that I I would sort of move away from that because I had a fear of God sort of instilled in me. I'm incredibly grateful for that. But at the same time, there was a lot of challenge. There was a lot of headbutting as I got to be an older teenager with my family because of differences, because of how I saw things differently. I didn't see everything the same way. There were some things that didn't make sense to me. I couldn't figure out why it mattered. For instance, why does it really matter if you get to work at 8.30 and leave at 5? I couldn't figure that one out. I thought, look, if the work is done, isn't that what matters most? But no, it is not what matters most. Why? Because my father has a different set of core values there. And mine is like, isn't it about the work? And it's like, well, it's about the discipline of it. Two very different people seeing things in different ways. And a family grows in unison until a family begins to separate out. And these distinctions produce challenges. But let me just say this to you. I want you really quick to think about someone in your life that this is true of. It could be a child, it could be a friend, it could be a parent, it could be a boss, whatever it is. But I don't want you to go too far out. I'm not looking at, let's think of the people who are way out there somewhere in the world that we're different than. I'm talking about the people who are in your sphere because I don't find it to be incredibly helpful to figure out how to see eye to eye with a person you're never going to meet. But what about the people in your world? These distinctions often divide us. There's tremendous amounts of tension and distance that grow and occur whenever these familial distinctions, you start to see them, you don't know how to deal with them, and it's both sides. What a parent will do is try to put into the child, look, see it my way. The child is going, I don't see it your way, I see it my way. And so a distinction begins to develop. But really, the distinction isn't the problem because God put distinctions in people so that the work could be done to all people. Do you realize this? It takes more than an administrative gift or a creative gift to reach people for Jesus. It takes different perspectives, meaning that you're going to look at one very important thing from this angle, and someone else close to you is going to see it from the completely opposite side. I was reminded of this last night. I'm not going to go into too much of it, and I'm not going to share the names, but as someone in this church sent me a message and revealed or relayed rather a story about someone that they knew who had been experiencing some significant challenges. This person was living a lifestyle that would be abhorrent 
to someone who would say, I follow Christ and I abide by his law and rule. But this person in our church approaches me with compassion for this person because there's a backstory there. I was incredibly moved as I read this account. I was incredibly moved as I read the words from the person in our church because I was, I was proud and I was encouraged that someone could see someone who by all appearances on the outside would be completely lost, wayward, and needs to figure it out, which is what most people would say and most people were saying. But this person saw it from a different angle. This person saw the pain of the person. This person saw that they were hurting. This person saw that this individual needs Jesus. And what can we do about that? Is there anything we can do about that as a church? And I got to tell you, that right there speaks to my heart. And the reason is because there are different ways of approaching this unity But unity is not sameness. Unity is embracing the distinctions that God has put in individuals. Sometimes those distinctions will lead us into a place where we're not doing everything right. I'm convinced that a lot of the reason for that is because our distinctions are not embraced. They're not identified with at a young age. And look, I'm not here to teach a parenting seminar, but usually we try to figure out how do we get rid of those things? We don't really know what to do with it. It's like holding a hot coal. And so what happens is so many people grow up feeling different. I'm convinced that if I were to ask you, how many of you in this room, raise your hand if you grew up feeling like there was something just different about you that you didn't quite fit in with everyone around you. Maybe you didn't quite fit in in your family. Many people would say, yeah, that's me. You wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it by looking out at faces. Everyone sort of looks generally human in here, but at the same time, there's something in us that would say, man, if I could have a coffee with you, I would love to tell you what my struggle is. And that struggle usually goes back to figuring out where I belong. But in the family of God, in the body of Christ, we all belong. We all have a part to play. And I just want to say this to you. Maybe you're in the room and you feel different. The world will tell you what that difference is for. The world will tell you that difference is so that you can go express yourself as freely as you choose to express yourself. Here's the challenge with that. And I know this personally. We are not equipped with the answer in and of ourselves. I'll say this to you younger people in the room. I know that it is difficult to receive the advice of an older person. Even though you know they've walked this road before, you would say, yes, but you're not me. And you don't understand. In part, you may be right. In part, you're wrong. But here's the deal. It isn't so important that you're right or wrong. The important thing to know is this. That inside of you does not lie the answer where if you go try to figure it out on your own and express yourself in any way you want and do whatever you want to do that eventually you'll get to that place of peace. Because can I tell you this? Peace is not a place. Peace is a person. You will never find what you're looking for. Young person, older person, never find what you're looking for outside of the person named Jesus. Which means the only way to feel the tuning fork of your soul is to be about what he has made you to be. And that is distinctive. That is personal. That is beautiful. That is worth celebrating. That is worth listening to. See, you were made uniquely, perfectly by God, but you were not made to be the mold for all other people after you. You may see your path, the path you've walked, see the wisdom in it, And say, this is the way you should go. But God will start to lead someone close to you in a different way, in a slightly different path. 
We're not talking again about uniting the entire world. We're talking about the body of Christ, those in relationship with Jesus. This is so important because we spend so much of our time trying to find our people, our people, people like us. I'm convinced that we have found our people for the most part by what I read on social media. And I don't say this just to be funny. I don't even know if it's going to be funny, but uh, the thought I had was, so we'll see. I can tell that we found our people by the way that we sort of throw out statements about the state of the world, statements about the state of our country, statements about the state of our politics, statements about the state of people. I'm convinced there aren't too many people in our friend group that we know. Now, we all have those Facebook friends that no one knows, right? I don't know where they come from. I don't know who they are. I have a large contingent from, the play, from India. I don't know how that happened, but there's a lot of them there. But I'm convinced we're not close to, close to any of them because the way we talk is just like, you know what? This is what I think. Actually, let me preface it. I know I'm going to lose a bunch of you people that I don't really care about anyway if I say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. That says I found my people. I found the people who think like me, talk like me, vote like me. Same worldview as me. The body of Christ is not sameness. If we are to be who we're called to be, we have to look beyond our own people and find the distinction and celebrate the distinction. Why? Why? Two things, really quick. The first is that we are needy. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. We are needy. I want you to say that after me. Say, I am needy. Doesn't feel good, does it? It's true. We have been conditioned not to say that. But we are needy. We need each other. We need each other. Look, this is why we do small groups at Church on the Move. Because we are needy. Now, there are two reasons. I can only speak for men in this, but there are a couple of reasons. Uh, three, why men don't get involved in small groups. The first one you could say is time, but I think that's mainly an excuse because we got plenty of time, but we just don't want to make the time. But that's the first one, time. I don't got the time. The second one is, I don't want to get in there and talk about my feelings. Essentially, I don't want to be vulnerable. One, because I'm not convinced it's going to help me. Two, because ah, it's weak. I don't want to sit around and cry. Right? I don't want to cry. Too much to do to cry. Too strong to cry. I'll cry right now if I have to, just to prove a point. I can't cry on demand, but anyway. <laughs> the other one is this. I don't want to get in a room and get stuck with a bunch of people who aren't like me. Oh, man, you see the group. You walk in. If you could just sort of do a flyby of small groups that you would maybe be interested in walking into, you're going to see the one guy in there. You're going, I'm not sitting in there with that dude. He's too different. They're weird. That's weird. I'm not going to do that. But let me just tell you this. We are needy. And what is the need? We need each other, but we need the distinction. Why do we need the distinction? Because we are needed. We are needed. Who is waiting for you on the other side of perspective? Someone is in your path, you just can't see them. They are waiting for you on the other side of perspective. Maybe you can see them. It might be a family member waiting for you on the other side of perspective. I'm not talking about worldly tolerance. I'm not talking about being open to things that this book says, eh, not going to go there. But even if the person with distinction holds some of those things that you would say, I can't go there, it doesn't mean that you can't listen and see where God is in the distinction. Listening to someone doesn't mean that you embrace everything that they are. It means that you value them. As a human being, 
Christ's worldview demands that we elevate the value of a person above the distinction. If you are to follow Jesus, if you are to be a Christ follower, it means that you value people above differences. Now that statement is true for everyone in the body of Christ and outside of the body of Christ. The thing that moved me so much about what the man sent me last night was that he saw value in someone. Not part of this family, not part of the family of God, not part of the body of Christ, but as an image bearer of our Heavenly Father. We all carry that sameness in us that God made each of us. The last thing I just want to leave you with is this. That is not something so light that you can cast off. That is not something so small that you get to decide when they don't matter anymore. That's not our job. Our job is to see the God in people. Whether they turn or not, It doesn't mean we say, everything you do is fine. But I would say we don't lead with that. Pay attention to the distinction this week. And the the distinction in your home. The distinction in your spouse that you've learned to just sort of grow numb to. Just like, ah, it's just the way they are. I turn my ears off when they start doing that. Where is God in a distinction? Because let me just tell you this, there is a people that you're never going to see. There are people in your path you're never going to reach. There is a person in you that's never going to feel at peace until you begin to value other people. Because if you can't value other people when they're not perfect, you're never going to be able to receive grace yourself. Which means you're going to be torn in her conflict till the day you breathe your last breath. And God has something more than that for you. Unity, a united church, begins right here. And it begins in our circle. What has the Holy Spirit told you in this message? Where is he prompting you? When he speaks, he's expecting action. You don't have to solve it all. He'll give you the step. But we're going to take a step together because we're blessed when we hear this word and do it. Would you bow your heads, please? As we end every service here at Church on the Move, we end it with the opportunity to take a step. The step is a simple one. It is a step meant to move towards Jesus. What happens to all of us, whether we have acknowledged Christ before, whether we have prayed the sinner's prayer before, no matter how long we've followed, quote unquote, Jesus, we all begin to, at times, we drift. Sometimes we can drift in being very adamant about doing the disciplines that Christianity requires. We can be doing a lot and our heart be far from Jesus. Sometimes it's us going after our own way. We can drift from Jesus, but let me just say this, that no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been in here, the step is the same for all of us. And it's an important thing. I know that most people, when we get to this part, feel that this step is for those who would say, I've never had a relationship with Jesus before. That's for you, that's true. Or for people who say, I've completely fallen out of relationship. That's also true, the step is for you. But it's also for people who would find themselves in this sort of numb gray zone that I've lived in in my life many times. And you say, you know what? I hear this, God's prompting my heart and I'm gonna do something about it. And I find that doing something somewhat uncomfortable, it helps. Because it's sort of like like a a fork in the road moment where you say, you know what? I'm not gonna go to the right anymore. I'm moving to the left. I'm gonna go this way. I've been going down that road and I'm tired of it. And the step is a simple one. It's a lifted hand. 
It's all it is. A lifted hand. It's all it is on the outside anyway, but on the inside and the heart, it's more than that because it takes a lot on the inside. It takes a lot in the heart to get a hand on the outside to go up. But that's exactly what I'm asking for. So here on the count of three, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. I don't care if you've been here a long time. I don't care if you've lifted your hand before or not. I believe that the Lord is moving and wants to do something mighty in your life starting now. On the count of three, if that's you, lift your hand. One, two, three. Three, any hands? I see hands all over the room. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hand back down. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Say, you know what? Today's my day. Just a couple more moments. A couple more moments. Anyone else? Say, today is my day. I'm lifting my hand. I am not going to leave the way I came in. Anyone else mean business? Anyone else feel that tug on their heart? Just a couple more moments. I see you in the back. Thank you so much. You can put your hand up. All right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray a prayer. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to pray this after me. Repeat this after me. Say this, dear Heavenly Father, here I am. You see me. You made me. You love me enough to save me. You sent Jesus to this earth to reveal who you are. He loved. He loved the um, the broken. He loved the broken. The imperfect. Thank you, Jesus, for coming for me, for dying on the cross for me, for being resurrected for me. I accept what you did for me, and I move towards relationship, a greater connection than ever before. I'm not going back to where I was. I leave different because you're in me. You strengthen me. You lead me and guide me. And I follow your voice. Thank you for finding me today. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray for every person, whether in the room, whether through the camera, every person whose heart you're moving on. I thank you so much for loving us, for seeking us out. You are not comfortable in the distance. You are always knocking. But it's up to us to open the door and receive you. Give us the strength, Lord, to receive you. Give us the strength to take the step you've given us today. Help us, Lord, to bridge gaps where distinction has divided, Lord. It's an opportunity for us to grow stronger, to be united. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Hey, I am so glad that you were able to join us for this message. Pastor Gabe's message on unity is just what we need today in this divided world. If you are one of those people, wherever you are, and you felt that nudge, I need to pray that prayer. Or I need to begin a walk with Jesus. We want to help you do that. Take out your phone, send me a text message, the word Glenpool to the telephone number 23101. You'll see a little menu come up on your phone and there's one there that says, I raised my hand. Just give us enough information that we can reach out to you. We've got some materials. We want to help you, want to communicate with you. I promise we won't bug you, but we want to be a blessing to you. Join us again next week. This series is just beginning and we're so excited you're a part of it. See you soon.